and because of how the commission's rules and you know it is an escalation of interest and just can go further on, but we're a middleman. Uh, if you're representing a company, you're not a middleman, you're on one side. So not wanting to go there, we had the idea, we started IG2, uh, that was, we kind of laid the found the foundation for it over the next couple of years. Uh, got up the nerve to venture out on our own and left the, the sweatshop life of big law firm and started up our company. And to our surprise, we started getting clients on the right in some way. But we were marketing just the escrow service, a very, very niche service. And then within the first year, we got a phone call from a uh, systems engineer at a publicly traded Silicon Valley company that said to us, if you guys can do the escrow, and our lawyers tell us you can do it for us, that we have some data tapes that um, we need to manage. And that seems to us like it would be easier than what you're doing for us right now, and you fold that in. Um, now, that's kind of what led to us getting into the data storage side of the business, um, which I think most of you are in already. So, uh, anyway, just I'm going to explain the escrow side, and there, to, for our business, there's definitely a connection between the two. It may or may not be the case, and you have to evaluate yourself, but that led us into the business, and now we uh, we've about 350 clients. Our business is pretty evenly split between providing escrow services on the litigation side and transactional side, as well as doing the data tape management in the vault. Uh, let me ask you this: How many of you actually use uh, commercial grade software to run your operations, where you rely on this software? Not often. Not not going to Best Buy and retrofit something, but I mean, you can have fun, tape track or whatever else. Like Pretty much everyone, I would assume. Um, escrow deals with a couple of things. Namely, as I said, it's a contingency plan. So what would happen if your developer disappeared tomorrow? How would that impact the business? Uh, what kind of consequences might you face if you had zero support for your product? What kind of operational nightmare would it be if you software just broke down and you didn't know if the tapes were in the slots. It, it would be, for us, it would be a disaster. Um, and that gets to the heart of, of this whole escrow process. Um, we have clients where that's happened to them in the past. And from, on the other side, when I was practicing law, I had some clients that got burned by dot-com flameouts, companies that over-promised and under-delivered. Funding dried up, they disappeared. And in fact, we have one of our clients uh, had an interesting way of describing it. Um, he said that there was, for him, getting burned, and he lost a couple million dollars uh, because of a development failure. For him, getting burned was like buying an expensive car and finding out that uh, that the, the company goes under business, goes out of business, and you buy the board, it's gone tomorrow, and your car breaks down. Then you go to get it fixed, you take a little shot, and you find out that the hood is sealed shut, and there is no way you can get at the engine. That's, that's the dilemma. Um, so, first thing you need to know is how do, this deals with system acquisition, so how does it work? Um, generally, when you buy software, and this is a little bit of, this is going to be kind of like a, a really high level legal overview, because it's escrow is essentially Basically, when you do a system acquisition, you are bargaining for a few things. People think about getting your hands on really cool technology and making the workflow process in their own environment a lot smoother. And, and that's really important. That's why you buy the software to begin with. But the way you buy it is, is really critical. Uh, a typical transaction, you negotiate a contract. So hopefully, you get your, if you're going to spend real money on it, you get your lawyer involved. Um, preferably somebody who knows software deals and not a lawyer is the same. Um, just like every, not a storage company. And you negotiate reps and warranties, you make sure that you know, you've got your covered, there's going to be no viruses, no, uh, no trap doors, that they've got the rights to the 
right to use, but then they tell you you can't reverse engineer the software. Uh, another code is just kind of like modifications. Uh, basically, you can't look under the hood, and there's no way to get under the hood of the software. So uh, that's great. the second point. There's a second contract or a second part of that initial contract was signed. There'll be a support payments agreement. So I might take it or whatever other software is, and I'm going to sign that license agreement, and I'm going to bet I'm going to assume I'll rely on the software for five to ten years going forward. So I'll sign up for support payment tools in that five to ten year period. So they're going to guarantee that they're going to do bug fixes, new versions, they're going to be updates, new releases. If I call up and say slotting didn't run, then they're going to knock your out of the bed and fix it. Um, that's how support payments works. And if they blow it, then there are consequences. Um, but that, but support maintenance is basically how the, the developer uh, can justify keeping you from looking under the hood of the software. You're not buying it, you're licensing it. You're not getting, you're not, you don't have the ability to see the custom program. And then the third part, or what you should do, you can negotiate to buy the technology that you're going to rely on in your business, is you need to look at the what ifs. And that's something that is too <coughs> often overlooked. Uh, termination provisions, the exit strategy, because at some point every relationship is going to come to and when you're looking at, you know, a, a program that you really want to have in your company, and that your IT guy is just selling, or and, and he's telling you, you got to buy this, um, you're not thinking about what happens, you know, when the love test is over and the, and the developer has hard times, and or you or the software doesn't work as it was promised, and you know you're screwed essentially. So um, that's what you want to consider with your deal team. For that with your attorney as well. Um, no one wants to talk about it. There are two situations that, that, that are really critical. There's a voluntary uh, termination and there's the involuntary. The voluntary is basically if you can cancel it. Okay, say that the program, you use it for a while, maybe you do a trial period. It doesn't work out for you. You give it back, you turn it off. Um, developer maybe gives you a refund. If you part ways, it's fine. Uh, you do it for a test drive, it wasn't for you. Uh, the second kind of scenario is the dire case, and that's where out of necessity, you're in voluntary. Okay, that's where I'm relying on the software. My clients are using the client version, and the developer disappears, or the developer goes bankrupt. He says any kind of situation that is completely out of the control of, of the person, you be out of your control, and it can cause serious damage to your business. Um, so like I said, people think that this whole deal process with the software, when you buy software, it's about functionality. From our view, it's actually not. About code. And think about it um, next time you try to decide to do that with any aspect of your technology, you might want to take a look at it this way. Um, when, when you license software, you're provided with object code. Object code allows you to run the program, but it's not what's under the hood. Um, source code is what the developer actually, the programmers actually create. Format so that they can have the machine computer execute what you want them to do. So the source code is basically just the program, and that's the crown jewel of the developer's assets. It's the intellectual property. <coughs> and I'm assuming most people are familiar with intellectual property. It's basically anything that you can patent, copyright, or it's a trade secret business. It's something that you don't want to get in the hands of your competitors. It's something that people are paying you for, and you need to keep it secret. Um, so obviously, if I'm buying software to run my ball, uh, I'm, the developer is not going to give me the IP. So what happens is the developer will run the IP through a compiler or an assembler. That's basically a program that generates an executable version. And that's what they install in terms of object code on my system. So now I have this object code. And it allows me to do all kinds of great things in my operation. It's running, I can use it. But Again, I can't, it's, it's that part that is, it's basically, if you have the, uh, the auto analogy, it's all the bells and whistles. It's going to allow me to drive really fast, it's got it's all the features, but again, it's not going to allow me any means of supporting the software or making changes or fixes or anything else.
made a significant investment in the corporate software asset, and your business is going to rely on that for years to come, you expect to. How do you ensure the ongoing viability of the software if you don't have control of the code? That's the central issue, the fundamental issue of every technology deal, and it's also the core of our escrow business. The potential scenarios are where things can go wrong would be if the developer breaches its support obligations. Say that you have a problem with the software and you have in your contract that they have to reply to you within a day or within a few hours if it's a certain level of, of issue. And so they don't. That could trigger a breach uh, of a support obligation and that might be because of any number of reasons in the background. Maybe that company's underfunded. Maybe they're a startup. Lots of startups have great technology, but they're used to selling a license and they may not be around tomorrow. Um, they might have too many clients too soon. You could be a victim of your own success. There are companies that sell lots of versions of software and then uh, they find that they've been up more than they can chew. It's kind of like if you start up a new ball. Uh, but for us, when we started our data vault, we had started, if we went after 100,000 fake accounts with a lot of rotation, we would have never made one handle. The same thing can happen to a software company. They can have many users and not be able to support their users. What that translates into uh, is a huge, is, a, is basically a nightmare for you if you bought the product. Um, the developer can go out of business. That happened in the 90s with the dot com bus. Uh, that's something that's completely out of control. Uh, the software development can be acquired. Lots of times, the software companies are started just so they can pull them out. You know, it's, it's great technology, but it's not necessarily something that will stand alone for the test of time, and it's gonna, it's, but it's something that might be attractive to Microsoft and your associates. We used to have, I had one client that I did a bunch of acquisitions for, and we had an OCA clause in the agreement. And what that was is they had, um, Peter Associates is huge, but they have a fairly spotty reputation for service. And they, they will typically buy out a competitor and sunset the product. They'll take that software, they'll put it on the shelf, but they don't they basically want to take somebody out of the market. It's kind of like they're not buying your vault and putting it on ice. You know, buy, buy a competitor just to put them out of business. So um, I did several deals where we had an OCA clause. And that which meant that if Computer Associates bought the company, all of the IP was going to get released to the client so that they could continue to use that system, which they already paid for in the first place. Uh, so it made sense. The other one is the last one, the software guru goes away. That's the one, that, that's kind of a flaky uh, situation where, you know, you have a, a, a company that relies basically on one guy who is the mastermind behind the program. Say he gets burned out, you know, he goes and becomes a market to bed. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing that they happen. Um, or he's made a lot of money and he just doesn't want to work anymore and he's just tired of it. He doesn't want support calls, doesn't want to get page. He just checks out. Well, that can also be a disaster because you're, he may be the only one in the company that really truly understands the system. So you may have a company that's viable, a software company that's still continuing to try to provide support, but they might not be capable of doing it. Um, if any of these things happen to you, what would you do? Anybody had it happen? Company go out of business, just doesn't work out, just we left hold of that. No one? Your fortune? Great. Uh, Great. The, the one thing that I've had happen to me, uh -huh. and I don't know whether this would be an, an escrow, escrow matter, but where you bought closed source software that has a bug in it, uh -huh. and the developer just refuses to fix the bug. So do people put that in escrow agreements, some, a clause that says that if there's a bug and the bug's not fixed within a certain time, they Absolutely. can invoke yeah. the... Yeah, it's just, it's just like if you had a service level agreement for uh, your own business right now. You know, like if you have a rush, you own a data vault and client calls you and says they need to take it there on the time. You know, your critical rush is maybe an hour, two hours. Same thing you know, with those with software contracts. If you have that bug, it's closed source, you bought it from somebody and they have an obligation, you know, you, you try to negotiate in a way that they're going to support it and a requirement they support it for the next amount of time. Um, but if they can't, then you're still left. You may have a piece of paper that says they have to do something, but the bottom line is that you can't really force anyone to do something they don't want to do. So you need to have another way of fixing that bug or, or moving on to doing something else.
Um, so any of those kinds of scenarios can pose serious consequences for you using the system and you know, and, uh, and it happens. So basically, what you want to do is figure out a way to either unplug the system. Eventually, you have to unplug the system, and you're going to transition to something else. Um, and what that's going to involve are several things. And I've seen each of these happen.
information is what's important. No one, and no one's going to give you a warranty on that or tell you that they'll cover you. You can't buy insurance to reconstruct data. You, well, actually, I guess you could, but it would be so prohibitively expensive that no one, does, no one actually does it. Um, so what you're trying to do with the escrow is you're trying to provide a form of insurance to give the buyers a peace of mind that things go bad and they're not going to get burned. Um, so you give them a means to make a worldly transition to that new system if they need to, or if they have the ability to get access to the source code, then maybe they can bring in some talent, some programmers that can actually help them to continue to support the product and continue to use the product. And that's the ideal situation. Great. Can I just ask? Yeah. That obviously in the past people would put source code into escrow or code as such which is effectively business logic. Do you see down the track that people will end up putting data itself into escrow? Yeah, I'll get to that. We, um, we have done some of that in the litigation context. And, and I'll address that coming up. Um, I don't want to get it myself. The, um, now, why wouldn't the developer the need to? Obviously, there are lots of reasons why if you're buying software, you want to do escrow just so you have a backup plan. But the developer, may not be incentivized to do it. Um, or you would think it wouldn't be incentivized to do it. But in today's environment, especially after the dot-com fallout, uh, developers continually get their source code in escrow. And some of them actually, in our case, we have developers that will sign up and put, set a contract with us so that they have it in place for each sale ahead of time. Wait a minute. You're saying incentivized. I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was a requirement that they sell software that they're required by law to have an escrow. You're saying it's not? No, what we told you that, and I hope it wasn't an attorney. That is not <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is, a, this is a completely unregulated business. It might be, if you sell, there's one, there's, and this, the only exception to that might be if I'm selling software to the government, government procurement standards might require uh, that you put it in escrow. We do, we have lots of government deals, and the source code goes into escrow, but if Richards and Richards is going to go out and buy Andrews, there is no requirement at all. The only requirement is that the buyer think about the issue and that they make, and that they basically force the developer to do it if the developer is not offering to do it in the first place. What you think? What's the cost to the developer to do that? Does it vary? Yeah, it varies based on what, what we're actually doing, and when we'll get into that as well. Uh, but in terms of getting a developer to do this, there are developers that you are either licensing to large companies uh, where they have sophisticated buyers, procurement departments, they have licensing people in-house, or if they're giving it to an attorney, an attorney, a contract to a lawyer who actually does IT work, then they're going to have to put it into escrow. Um, and they can actually use that. If they stand behind the product, they can actually reap some benefits from it as well. The basic incentives for a developer to do this, uh, and that they're, they're, they, they might help them close a deal because they're showing that they're committed to the business, that they're going to be around. Uh, they're confident enough that they put it into escrow that it's not going to get out because they're not going anywhere. And they're showing the client that they're going to stand behind the product. I mean, that's the that's the essential uh, developer benefit, I guess. Greg, is, is there a concept of like a generic um, escrow? So, because to, to answer Steve's original question. So Steve would run O'Neill in his record centre. Are you named as a party to an escrow agreement for your O'Neill software? No, but on the, on the agreement that I signed with O'Neill, it does say down there that it is escrow. In fact, I think it even tells me where it's escrow. But, but you would actually have to be named as a party to the escrow agreement, wouldn't you, Greg? Well, this conversation illustrates exactly why. Hold your questions if they're related to specific contracts or price or the mechanics of the whole thing, because I think your, your, your questions are going to be answered. Uh, if they're not answered through the slides, I'll take questions at the end. But what you're getting at, and the, mis the misconceptions are illustrating exactly why, um, you know, why it's, it's, it's probably a little bit about this. So let me just get to it in due course. Um, <laughs> so Yeah, <laughs> 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 quick books open over here. <laughs> 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 
keep asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, like, what? These guys are attorneys. <laughs> 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 We're not in our capacity as attorneys. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. Um, the other, and, and if you're buying software, this, these kind of arguments are in terms of what it's like, what's the benefits to the developer. But things that if you get somebody who doesn't want to put in escrow, uh, you might want to point out. Um, so the first one is, hey, don't you stand behind your product? Aren't you going to be around tomorrow? I'm committing to you by paying a lot of money up front for this perpetual license. I'm committing to you. I want to know that you're going to be there for me. That's the essence of it. On the developer side, if they're smart enough to embrace this, uh, what they're dealing with uh, players that are the purchasers that are expecting it, then what they can do is instead of Number one, they're not going to, if they have it in place ahead of time before they offer it, they're not going to end up having to uh, address the issue of why don't they just sell their software up front like it was a customer program. And that happens in big deals. They'll say, I don't want to license it, I don't want to go do any kind of want with it, I want you to give me the code up front. And when you're, looking, when you're a developer negotiating with a big company, you may not have the leverage. I mean, for a lot of money, you choose, and you have to do it. Unless, of course, you just for those compliments. Uh, our developer client, is a small client, who uses a sales tool to be account in place. And when they go out to pitch any of you and try to get you to buy, they say, we've got the back end covered. And so it basically takes the issue off the table. Um, it's going to help them with their IP rights. Uh, and it also it also would help you as a buyer, right, if they take care of their IP rights. And here's how it works. Basically, in order to keep, yes, the intellectual property is what's really valuable. It's the patent rights. Copyrights, the trade secrets. In order to maintain those rights, you need to take certain steps under the law to preserve them. You can't let copies of the code float around. Um, you need to visually document new releases and updates and show that, um, basically, back up the, the timing and the process of development of that process from start to finish. Because somebody company may come along and decide they're going to sue you and try to grab the rights for themselves. And if you can't demonstrate it, if you could have a patent on it, they could try to invalidate it. Um, escrow helps with basically providing validation and mutual third party backup to help their case. So you as a buyer, what it means is if you're doing business with a company that's taken the, uh, the precaution of doing this, then their software is going to be around and they're going to have control of it to support your product. If they lose control of the product, <coughs> They're out of business anyway. You're going to be left holding the bag, just like in the, uh, the scenarios I outlined earlier. Um, asset protection, you want to make sure that there's extremely limited access to the code. Um, obviously, you can't get out. Um, it's got to be kept secret. It's got to be in a high security environment. This actually relates to the storage aspect of it. Um, now, in terms of escrow itself, key aspects to be aware of are that it's a quasi legal service, it's, it's specialized. It's a niche that doesn't even describe it. It's it's just a it's like a micro niche of a business. You have liability issues, and you need to understand two things: um, software and contracts. It's basically software deals. That's that's what escrow comes down to. Um, we we kind of kept our business under wraps for a while. We we like to fly under the radar screen. There aren't many companies that do this. Our clients are not just it's not a regional business, it's not a local business. For us, it's an international business. We have clients in 10 or 15 foreign countries now, uh, virtually every state, and the business comes to us from all over. It doesn't have, it's not, it doesn't matter where you're located, it just matters how you can provide the service. Uh, we treat it like a professional service, it's a positive legal service. Um, in terms of, uh, like I said, we flew under the radar screen until this article came out, I think the Lord passed out like a copy. We were featured in Fortune Small Business Magazine months ago because. They were doing an article that was initially going to be on IT security issues, and they talked to some big companies that happened to be clients of ours, and they mentioned that they used us for escrow, and that's kind of how uh, it came about. But it's not something that's on the front, that's kind of on the front burner for break. It's not something that you're that the guys in the data center probably know that much about. They know when they're buying systems, that can be valuable, we'll talk about that later, but it's, but it's not something that they think about if they're not in licensing. So it's a small group of players that deal with it. lawyers, licensing people, director level people that run that are in charge of software applications, CIOs. Um, 
Escrow depends on asset integrity and know-how, and this comes, uh, this has to do with something Gerard mentioned earlier. Whatever is put into escrow has to be appropriate so that you can actually use it. So the code has to be complete. The instructions have to be there to build the code or build the executable. You have to have a roadmap to how you use the stuff. What's your responsibility to know that? Is it? Pardon me? Do you have to tell them, they have to tell you that they do have a complete set of Exactly, yeah, they, yeah, and that, the response, right, there's no, there's no possible way that anyone can, any one person who's not, who doesn't work with that software company, can be absolutely sure without studying the code and being a skilled programmer that what they're giving you is complete. And that gets into verification and some other services that, um, that you can add on. But, but in terms of making sure, if you're setting up an escrow, one of the key aspects is to make sure that it is complete and that you have what you need. You know, it's kind of like your, you know, your insurance. You didn't know if your your place burns down. You should know. Hopefully, you know ahead of time. And you told us yesterday. You got to know what your coverage is and make sure that you have the kind of coverage that you need so you can get your business back up and running. Escrow works the same way. You need to make sure that you have the code and the instructions and everything else that you might need to get that software running again, or to maintain and support it, or change it so that you can keep your business up and running. Um, Trigger events. Basically, with escrow, you do set up a contract, and it's between the buyer and the seller and the escrow company. And part of that is going to be figuring out a plan for those what ifs. Okay, so what if X, Y, or Z happens, and you need to access the code? Um, these trigger events can be highly customized. You want to think. This is where this is where your lawyer you know, plays through all of those all the scenarios. You know, anything bad that can happen. Ahead of time, and they're not fun conversations to have with developers, but and there are some that are vanilla and out of the box, like for example, bankruptcy is the most common. Go bankrupt, what happens? But depending on what the buyer's needs are, and if they're spending, I mean, say they're spending millions on the product, and uh, the, the implementation of it is uh, is phased, and it's going to take it could take two years to implement fully, and there might be changes in custom. That are added on as they go. You need to address all those kinds of things as triggers in the contract. So you, get, you can get fairly creative and customized. Um, you're going to be involved in bankruptcy. You're going to need to know what the five is uh, in terms of intellectual property set aside and dealing with trustees. And, and hopefully, this is never going to happen. This is all contingency. So the reality is that you may set, the, set up an escrow, and in most cases, nothing happens. The developer does what he's supposed to do, his business flourishes and supports your product, you keep using it, you're fine. But in enough cases, things can go wrong, but if you haven't covered yourself here, um, it can just be a disaster. So with bankruptcy, you're going to need to be familiar with bankruptcy law. Have somebody in your organization who is familiar with bankruptcy law and willing to be the front man if litigation happens. Because if there is a bankruptcy, there will be side litigation and you'll be third party into it, guaranteed. Um, the last thing, the last consideration here you have to be aware of in the organization's business is the balance of interest. Um, like I said, we're, when we were attorneys practicing, we would represent one side. So it's really easy to advocate one position, argue against your client, your <coughs> the opposition's points, and you know, beat them up to get what you want, uh, or to get as much as you can from them. Uh, this is different. Uh, in escrow, you're a fiduciary. Have entirely different legal obligations that come with that. You're a middleman. You don't represent anybody. You're trying to provide a service that will benefit both parties in some way and that will take care of exactly what it is that they're trying to, uh, whatever doomsday scenario they have in mind. So you're trying to please two masters, and that can get tricky. Um, it's important to, so each, each is kind of a case by case deal or a project um, when there's big money involved. If they're tiny little software deals, then you know we have a little system that we use and we can crank those out pretty easily. Uh, but when it starts getting complicated or you're dealing with people that are spending real money, then you need to know what to do and what not to do. And that just you take that situation. Now, as far as the detail goes, there's, there's two types. In, in, in the world of IG2, we view it as two different types of services. And they're very different. The first one is transactional, and the second one is location. Transactions being when you license software, which is the, the more common one that you can be faced with, where you 
experience if you're buying software. On transactional escrow, you deal with deals. Um, basically, licensing deals, which is what I talked about at the very beginning. Um, you go out and you license the code and they support it. Um, we also we do licensing is a decent chunk of our business, but we do a whole bunch of others as well. We get involved in mergers and acquisitions. Um, we have one client who's done, who has both bought and sold divisions and used us to escrow code and provide certain um, short to midterm release of uh, escrow structures and release events that are predetermined um, and involve a lot of those what if scenarios. And none of them happens to be going out of business. They're all they deal with burnouts and other aspects of an FA deal. Um, venture capital. Uh, when someone invests in, I don't know if anybody here has private equity in their businesses, but when people invest, outside people come in and invest in a company, they're looking for an exit strategy. And they're also looking for some security, uh, security interest in the business or in whatever is valuable in the business. So we get brought in on VC deals when there's going to be an outside investor and they want to make sure that they, um, that number one, if a company matures enough that it can exit, that they can exit and make some money, that the IP is going to be intact. Or uh, if the company goes belly up, that they can grab the IP and they can commercialize it some other way. So we set those up as well. Uh, joint ventures. Sometimes you see companies, everybody talks about partnering with other companies. Like, you know, we do. We, we do business with a lot of other companies for business. Uh, Referrals or on the data storage sites or different accounts. In tech, lots of companies say they partner with each other and they may or may not really be partners. So for joint ventures, when they're legally partners, those deals typically end up breaking up. Um, almost always. They either break up or they get sold. Um, if there's a breakup, then you're going to have trigger events and you're going to have a fight over the code. Uh, and then there's development new products. When new software comes out, or when companies decide to get together and come up with a cool new product, then you know, we're often brought in so that they can set this up at the outset and it can support that licensing model going forward. Um, but the key thing is that any, no matter what kind of deal you get involved in, any release situation is going to involve pretty much all the players. Um, so you're probably going to get involved with buyers, sellers, bankers, lawyers, uh, trustees. Um, in terms of uh, the basic structure, it's, it is a contract. Um, you don't need to be, we wouldn't have gotten, whether you should, and I'll address a little later, getting into the business is something that um, for us just kind of happened, and there's a lot of risk involved. The one thing that I didn't really put on that last slide, but goes hand in hand with it, is that there's liability attached to any of those transactions. From, a, from the perspective of an escrow company, you can't always look at your liability. You're really, you can be really good about looking at liability in terms of box storage. You know, I'm going to pay you a penny box if anything goes wrong. Uh, or data storage, I'm going to pay you the replacement value of the LTO. But uh, with escrow, you can't always, because you're dealing with more sophisticated buyers, you can't always limit your liability because there are consequences if you do something wrong catastrophically like releasing the code to somebody different or, or acting that you shouldn't act or uh, being found in contempt, you know, and then you incur legal fees and those kinds of things, um, which, which leads to litigation, more litigation. Um, we found a way to make money on litigation. We, um, we started a service called Litigation Escrow, which is different from doing these deals. And it's something that we got into because we you know we have been over the years, we know there's a discovery dilemma when companies are fighting with each other over IP. Now, there are lots of companies that do litigation support. In fact, I know somebody in here says that they do litigation support. And that's a great business, but that's a business that has a lot of players, and it's a business that involves a lot of data and a lot of moving parts. Like, for example, email archiving, or it's a software kind of business. Um, litigation escrow, when we do it, is generally geared only to high stakes cases, so there's got to be a lot of money involved. Um, patent infringement cases are generally where people are fighting over IP rights. So say if uh, 
tape track got sued by Anders or O'Neill or someone, and they said that you know, the, the soft, you know, they ripped off the code and the software actually infringes on uh, Anders' code. You know, so they fight about the rights of it. That could happen. Um, nobody, or the misappropriation of trade secrets, say the salesperson gets hired, or a developer, a developer gets hired from one company to another company, and he takes technical information with him. It'd be like losing one of your key people who takes your client list and he goes to a competitor. I don't think they guys would hear it would sit still if they thought their client list was, was systematically poached by a struggle employee who left. Um, so what we do is we come in and help out with the next step, which is when people sue each other and they, they, they get into discovery, which is exchange of information. You, know, you have to show us your information through your face, we'll show you our information through our face, and then we'll go to court and fight over it in front of the judge. Um, let me give you an example. We were brought in by a company that manufactures handheld devices, wireless devices. Again, it's uh, it's a company whose name you instantly recognize, and they were uh, in a fight, a patent infringement lawsuit, with another company that um, developed software to run those handheld devices. They were fighting over the patents to the code that runs uh, the phone, basically. So they had, it was 13 patents that were issued. And they had been in court several times, and there were motions to compel, and they were they were burning uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in legal fees, fighting about the information that had to be handed over. And so the plaintiffs said to our client, "You need to hand over as part of discovery everything that has to do with these patents." And it'd be like your competitor suing you and saying, "You've got to hand over everything that has to do with your business." All your, all your client lists, everything about your tapes, your internal operations, all of it. Well, they didn't want to do that. So they brought us in. And we basically handled the case by uh, every case is a little bit different, so you do an analysis to figure out what the best way is to find a compromise, uh, which means reading a lot of going through the, uh, the records at that point, and then coming up with a way we did. This was over a terabyte of data. So we had some of our IT people. Uh, we came up with a plan to move that terabyte of data onto a separate standalone system, which we physically brought to our facility and vaulted, tracked using our tape management system. And then we came up with the rules of engagement for how the discovery would play out. In other words, who can come in to see who, who's going to have access to looking at that code uh, and under what circumstances, what can they do with it. And we hosted it in our facility in a lockdown and very controlled environment. And we did really well in it. That was a huge project for us. And it was money in it, but it also put us right in the middle of a $100 million lawsuit. Um, so it, it can be really lucrative, but if, um, if we hadn't kind of been through the drill on the other side as lawyers, it's not something that I want to touch. Um, but that's kind, of the, that's kind of the high end of, of doing escrow. So basically, it's a way that you can have, and we've done smaller cases as well, but similar to the sales guy leaving, where you know, if someone just doesn't want to give something up and they want to control the manner which is disclosed, that's how we do it. Um, so in terms of how it relates to, to any of you, um, you know, some of the maybe interest to you, it, it may not be. In terms of relating to your client stuff, um, all of your clients, Data storage clients love some software. So they're, they're in the same situation that you are with your vault software. They're probably vulnerable to developers defaulting, to losing the rights to their code, um, to the guru going on sabbatical, to, to bankruptcy, to whatever happens. Um, in terms of what it has to do with storage, the escrow part doesn't really have a lot to do with storage, except that you do put the code somewhere. I mean, so we vault the code, and any of you can vault the code. That's, that's something that you're all capable of doing. Um, in terms of what it has to do with the storage from our perspective, we view escrow as it's it's basically, look at it this way, the systems generate data. Every, every piece of software you find buys generates data. If you can do anything to help them keep that software running and 
the reliability of it, you create more data, and you put that data in your vault, and you make more money. So we try to sell escrow to our clients. And we have a lot of clients that just do it as a matter of course. Um, and hopefully that's going to help fill our vault. Um, in terms of should I get in this business, it's, it's up to you. Uh, if you're bored out of your mind by this, then I would say no. <laughs> there be a lot of you, I don't know. Um, if, uh, if, you, if you're really comfortable handling risk, then there's a reward component to it. Not necessarily transactions so much. You have to do a lot of volume on transactions to make money. Um, and to answer the question earlier, I'm sure I said, what does it cost? If we do a vanilla escrow deal, um, it's not going to knock your socks off. You know, if it's a small software product, then there's nothing like that. There's nothing really complicated about it. You know, we can do it in our sleep. Um, you know, because we've done it, we have the tools and the system in place. You know, they might get a thousand bucks for it. You know, and, and there's a new component every year. It's in effect. They'll pay us for it. But um, it's not going to make us rich. Uh, if we do, in the context of a venture capital deal or an M&A deal, if we do something that's really complicated, you know, it might be many multiples. The benefit for us is we don't have to outsource anything. Rarely do we use outside counsel because we already got the uh, we got the experience on our clients' nickel, and now we're on doing it for ourselves. Um, we only engage outside counsel when uh, we're in a sticky situation. But we don't find ourselves in a situation too often because we, we cover it up front. Um, so in terms of should I get into this business, I mean, you could be in our situation but in a couple by doing a couple of things. Uh, the first one out would be all that attractive. If you go to law school, we're going to switch out for seven or eight years. <laughs> um, <coughs> I wouldn't do that for a second. Um, you can, but it, would, it is important to learn the language and kind of get a feel for doing deals. Um, so you can hire lawyers. Um, the problem with that is to hire an expensive, to hire an experienced attorney, you're going to pay. In most markets, to get somebody who's got like five years experience, you're going to have to pay like 100 k a year for each guy. And that's the sort of cost I would want to bite off for each person. Um, you could, you would need to, but say you didn't do that. Or say you uh, decided you wanted to call, you find a technology lawyer. And you have to, to get someone to actually set it up for you or help you with each deal you have, you have to pay by the hour. That would be expensive. You'd probably be smarter to have some in house. Um, You'd have to develop your programs and kind of a system for doing it because you don't want to have to be in the wheel every time you have a project. Um, and you have to sell. And this is something, like I said, a lot of developers don't want to do it. You got to kind of, you know, until they get to come to Jesus' message from the client, they just, they resist. Um, we were kind of wired into it ahead of time. We had clients in the pipeline that we converted over to legal clients. <coughs> Starting from scratch, you got to sell to maybe a different market. You're selling to attorneys. Um, they may not be the easiest people to deal with. You're selling to software developers. Uh, you're selling to licensing executives. Um, the records manager is going to be anywhere, is anywhere in the equation. Um, it's the tech guys, the people making the technology purchasing decisions that might have input or would have input into escrow. Um, and you've got to tackle liability. Insurance is critical. Um, it's hard to find, similar to what you were talking about yesterday, it's, like it's difficult to find someone to write insurance for what we do because they don't understand what we do. So we've had to educate our carrier to get the plan that we wanted. Um, and there's liability because you don't always, you're not always able to tackle liability, so the insurance is really important. Um, that means you have to find yourself getting sued. Um, the other option that you would have is you can call us. <laughs> um, really blatant sales pitch. Uh, we do business with a lot of we do business with lots of people in the industry. Um, number one, we're not here to spawn competitors, but we also um, I mean I, I think it's great that the business is taking on a higher profile with us being in a magazine and with other companies. Um, there have been a few high profile flame outs in the tech world of companies going up there having uh, bad things happen, and it's highlighted the importance of protecting the code. So that's good for our business. Um, in terms
terms of for firms that refer business to us, um, what they get out of it is obviously they become a more valuable resource for their clients. Um, they, they can help solidify the relationship if they deal with the right people. And they can demonstrate that they're sophisticated about what's going on in their internal IT environment. And that they, um, they're looking out for it in another way. Aside from just throwing the tape, you know, your client's licensing software, and maybe the guy that you deal with isn't that sharp and knows about this, you might tell them about it, hey, you thought of this. They're going to think that they're going to they're make you further know even more about what you're doing and that they can turn to you for other services. And that's a good thing because you're deeper embedded in the organization. Uh, you help your clients by protecting the integrity of their systems. So, uh, or you might help them in a lawsuit situation. If, if, if they're getting sued and they need to, and they don't want to hang it, they're calling you with a huge, uh, they want a whole bunch of tapes, and it's for discovery, ask them why. And ask them if they're really going to let somebody do a data dump of all that information, and what the consequences could be, and have they thought about it. Because their lawyer might not be that involved in that part. The lawyer might just have, they have to produce this, and the client may not have told them, wait a minute, there's trade secrets on those tapes. I don't want to get involved. If you know your client's going to be sued, or they pull, they pull a ton of data, and it's for a lawsuit, ask them. And then what we do, uh, or what you can do, if you don't get involved in that, is you can let us do the work. We have, uh, we pay referral fees to companies that bring us in, and uh, we handle it from there. So, we've done it with a number of companies in the business. Most of our business, like I said, comes from the in-house people or attorneys. But it's something that is more and more if you want to get into total information management, or data management, or IP management. However you spend, um, you're not, uh, just like we're not capable of providing this, this comprehensive suite of services, we do two things, we do them very well, just the data storage and the technology escrow. Um, you may not be able to provide top-notch service in several different lines of business, but if you can be a resource or a go-to person for your client, and they have a need or they get in trouble, uh, then they're never going to leave you. Uh, I have just a question. Do you support uh, any like uh, retail partners on with marketing and sales? Retail partners? Yeah. You just said let I do, do referrals. Do. Yeah. We. Well, here's something else. Uh, when I say referral, if um, you know, say Brad has somebody who picks to, and he and they need to put something in place for litigation. Uh, if Brad calls us, then I mean, number one, there's a lot of liability associated with a service. So we're on the contract. Brad will be involved, we pay Brad a referral fee, a percentage of whatever it is that the project ends up uh, coming out at. And we can have market in terms of marketing it, do we like, co-brand it with anybody? No, it's an IGC service. But uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been on phone calls with people where they thought they were going to have a situation. So we got on a conference call, we talked to the client, and we let them know kind of, you know, our referrer does the intro. Describe the situation, we walk them through it, and then if it turns into a real project, we do the project, they sign up as an IGT client, um, and the referrer stays involved to know what's going on. Obviously, we do the work, they collect the check. But in terms of co branding it, now we don't co brand it. Hey, okay. Greg, do you want to store the types? Pardon me? Do you want to store the types in that scenario? Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. It depends. Um, usually, the we Pardon me. He, he asked, Brad asked if he would store the tapes. Say there's litigation, and there's going to be a, a review of lots of data, and you've got to put this escrow thing in place. Um, it depends on, it's a logistical answer, really. We, do, we generally do it in Chicago because we have the physical setup to do it, and our people have been through the drill. They know how to, you know, our employees are familiar with doing it. Um, we will do it if there's a reason why. If every, if every other player is located in one other place and they hire us, they hire us for our expertise, not for our location. So we would go, say that it was in Sydney. We would fly out to Sydney and we handle it in Sydney. And the tapes would be in Sydney. Okay. Sure, John. How do you figure out what your insurance, what kind of insurance do you get that 
covers you, if, and how do you figure out how much you get because of the multi-million dollars potentially involved? Well, you figure yeah, out what you need. The insurance, it's, it's, a, it's a specific professional liability policy. We have comprehensive general and everything else that you guys have, but we, all, we, just, we have professional liability insurance that covers our specific activities. So we had to get into some granular detail with the underwriter in describing what it is that we do um, on both sides of the transaction and litigation. It's similar to like a computer programming insurance policy with, it sounds similar to what you see as with the manuscript. Kind of. <laughs> What safeguards would you put in an escrow agreement to stop stop the whole thing getting caught up in litigation in the end anyway? Well, so that's, yeah, that's, that's a really good question because contract, <laughs> the agreement has to be really tight. You have to, you can't have a lot of wiggle room. Um, but that being said, it's just a piece of paper. You know, if, if Gerard and I have a contract and someone doesn't follow it, then it doesn't matter what the document says. I have to go to court to enforce it. And that costs money and takes time to each hassle. Um, one way around it is you can use arbitration. And if you're going to use arbitration, then you want to have very specific provisions that outline. You can't just say we're going to have mutual three party arbitration and it's going to be in Chicago. That's going to, all that's going to do is get you fighting about the details of the arbitration. So, so, so the only person who can make you release the source is the court. So let's say, for instance, someone defaulted on an escrow agreement. Yeah. Someone would have to go to court to give you an order to release no. the source code. Actually, no. And that's why it's, it's not, no. In a cookie cutter world, that would be the case. Um, but that's not the case. If we, you know, in the most basic of transactions, you might have, um, you might have a vendor default. The vendor goes bankrupt, and I mean, they're completely out of business. And there's no, there's no fight for assets. There's no bankruptcy.